Hello, everybody. My name is Wonderful German. It's Tim Messerschmidt. I hate it. <laughs> and today my talk is going to be Open Identity, getting to know your users, and basically the cool stuff that you can do with that. So as it got mentioned already, I'm a developer evangelist at PayPal. And whenever I turn up at the JS Com for something, people are like, what? PayPal? Really? <laughs> so, what does PayPal actually do at JSConf? PayPal used to be a bank, right? Like, that, that's one of those companies running C, C++ in their back ends, having really awkward UIs and stuff like that. That was with our old CEO. So then a new guy called David Marcus joined that, being a startup guy. And he decided, let's throw all of that stuff away and hire some great people. So we had people like Doug Crockford joining us. We've got Bill Scott now with us. And those guys decided to create something amazing. So our new backend is basically running on Node.js. We use Dust for data binding. We use Backbone. So lots of cool stuff that you guys use in your project are now running on our scale as well. So about my talk. First of all, you can go to developerpaper.com, but this is not going to be about paper products now. This is going to be about different Open Identity technology. That's OAuth, OAuth 1A, OpenID Connect, OpenID, Browser ID, all that stuff that helps you to create great user experience. So what really is identity? I think the best way to explain anything is using Lego and using ninjas. So I heard it, yeah, thanks. <laughs> so on the interwebs, I can be whoever I want, right? Like, I go to a web service, I go to any site, I register my account, and I say, my name is Mr. T, I'm wearing big golden chains, I don't like flying around, I'm basically part of the A-team. How can you prove that? You can't really, right? Also, for some use cases, I want to really be me, because it might be that this is closely uh, connected to things like shipping items to me. And then I want to make sure that I really prove my identity. So these are some of the things that I'm talking about. And also I want to talk about how to bring this technology, how to bring stuff like OAuth into not just the logging in context, but also into stuff like API communication. So. If you have any questions during the talk, feel free to reach out to me, but also I'll be available after this uh, session to discuss anything. So lots of people use identity always the same way. They go to a web service, they use a mobile application, and what they do is they use Twitter, Google+, or Facebook all the time. Mostly it's even the same service. The reason for that is they don't really care. They just share their details, and they want to log in quickly, right? The issue is, should we really do that? Like, should you always expose the same identity, and does it always make sense to use the same identity? I don't really think so. Also, I want to cover some slight annoyances that I see. People often confuse the topic authentication versus authorization. So authentication. That's what you might expect from stuff like OpenID, Browser ID. So authentication technology is about proving that the person logging in at the service or the person using resources is actually you. So that's really about identity. While authorization is mostly about sharing resources. So that could be your direct messages at Twitter, that could be your Google Plus stream, that could be lots of different stuff like Facebook image upload. Anything that basically can do interactions with an API could be a resource. The issue is, due to the mixed up nature and messed up nature of identity products, often authorization gets misused to, use, uh, to basically do authentication. So that is something like an endpoint slash profile me, something like that. That works kind of, but it's not like how it should be. So let's have a look at the current standards in order to understand where we are, what's coming up, and what you maybe should rethink. So basic auth is quite known, right? Like 
we pass it as a header, then we have um, the base64 encoding, or you can pass it in the URL. This is basically really like passing your client ID and the secret, your username and password, anything like that. That was kind of suitable, but it's not really secure. Now, in 2007, the final draft for something O of 1 got released. Whoever implemented O of 1? Who liked it? See? <laughs> Same happened to me. So my background is actually I'm coming from the Android world, and I was forced to do some JavaScript. And I, it really turned out I kind of liked it. And while on Android it was really shit because it was Java that you had to use, on JavaScript you at least have amazing libraries nowadays, like Passport, that help you. But still, O of 1 is kind of clunky. So lots of interesting people, like Aaron Hammer, were included in this. Aaron Hammer was one of the contributors at IATF. And you will see this name later on in my slides. So lots of companies like Twitter, Yahoo, Google, started to use O of 1 because it allowed users to actually use their Google account and other services to use data from that. So basically, it allowed to have a much nicer login experience. And login experience is really something that matters. Now, sadly, in 2009, there was a big issue. We come to that. But first of all, let's have a look at the flow. It's totally convenient. So people, first of all, have to request something they call a request token that's on the consumer, which is basically client side. And you have on the right side the service provider. So that might be Twitter, that might be Google, Facebook, whatever you want. Now, after this token got generated and got returned to the consumer, the user is going to be uh, redirected to the service provider. He has to log in. Then, depending on the flow, he might get something which was called OOB, which was basically a code that he could copy-paste into another window again. Or you could use something they call verification code basically to obtain the authorization. So user logs in, says, yes, this application should definitely have all my images. So I log in, then this uh, funny authorization token gets generated. And on my consumer side, I'm going to exchange that thing for something we call access token. So again, we talk to the service provider, and the service provider makes sure that this is still the valid user. Sounds kind of good, right? And then, with the access token being returned to my consumer, I can do things like requesting resources. So far, so good. But O of 1 had some flaws. Initially, the client got the redirect URI. So where basically the service provider should lead you after doing things like the authorization in the second step. So the user got redirected to the site that you uh, provided. But what if a counterattack would be done? So people could actually use this redirect URI and get the uh, needed authorization code and basically hijack your identity, which is not really nice. So they came up in, uh, with this thing called O of 1.a or 1.0a, whatever you like. And the idea was we move this now into the first step. So you cannot just easily modify uh, the OAuth flow, and therefore it's much more secure. And actually, it kind of worked. But having a look at this, it's kind of complex. There is a lot of steps involved. And the issue is, this was not really designed with things like mobile in mind. This was not designed with things like embedded systems in mind. So it had to be simplified, and there had to be more scenarios. So OAuth 2 came up. So this was definitely focused on simplicity. This was focused on things like different scenarios. The final framework got basically released in 2012. And everything seemed to be amazing. It uses bearer tokens, which basically are used to do the authorization via the header. It was much easier than OAuth 1, because OAuth 1, without using a library on the client side, was a huge pain. So whoever implemented OAuth 2 client side? Did you like it more than OAuth 1? It's much easier, really. 
um, basically, if you understand how to set one single header, that's it. That's all you need. It's much easier. Sadly, there were again issues. Let's have a look at Beflow. So instead of doing something like generating this request token that kind of not really is authorized, we direct the user immediately to the service. Again, we obtain the authorization. Again, we get the access token. And we use that thing to request resources like your profile and stuff like that. So they got rid of one whole step. So there's this thing called free legged or off, and there's this thing called two legged or off. And that's basically what you see over here. So if you depend, uh, basically compare this against this, it's much easier. And this is why you don't have to fiddle around so much with libraries anymore, because it got basically uh, designed with easiness in mind. Now the issue again is, OAuth 2 was designed initially beginning of 2009-2010. IETF is kind of big as a group. Lots of companies uh, are being involved. So one guy last year released a really angry blog post. Who saw that on Hacker News? So Aaron Hammer, um, basically being one of the main guys behind the whole OAuth 1 thing, behind the all of two thing, at some point decided this is all crap. So they've been designing this one big solution that should help corporates, that should help startups, that should help independent developers to quickly create um, things like um, the authorization for your service. The big issue was there, was there were basically too many scenarios and too many people involved. And so this, his big statement was that while OAuth 2 basically being nice, it's more than a, it's just a blueprint. So basically, it tells you you could do it like that, you could do it like that, but it's not really being concrete. While the OAuth 1 spec, uh, specs were really concrete in nearly all details. So Aaron was really pissed off. And that's right. <laughs> so there's another guy who does lots of uh, blog posts about security, who does lots of things like uh, bug hunting. Um, his name is Igor Homakov. And he wrote this other big blog post about OAuth 2 being basically a huge, huge attack surface. Because there's things like the access token. So the, the, the initial thought behind an access token is once you have that thing, you do stuff like um, you throw it against the server to get direct messages. You throw it against uh, the server to do things like posting and you tweet. Everything that you basically do works with the same access token. But that thing doesn't really expire. So if somebody manages to get your cookie and he has access once to your access token, he has access to all your resources. And that's not really great, right? So people came up with the idea they could make expiring tokens, but that doesn't still really solve the problem, right? Because it doesn't really matter to me if I have two minutes access to your resources or 10 hours. If I have access, I can get your resources. So there were lots of different discussions going around uh, of two being not secure enough and of two being secure enough. And Basically, what you will see is, if you have a look at companies that use OAuth 2, like Twitter and Facebook, or even us as PayPal, um, lots of them do lots of server-side modifications around this blueprint. So security implementations are possible, but the protocol doesn't really tell you how. So you, ne you need to be really aware about how to do that. Now. We basically have now the um, big, nice authorization. So we could get uh, resources. But initially, OAuth was meant to be something anonymous. So whenever I log in um, using OAuth, I don't want to grant you my username, not my password. I don't want to fill in lots of details. But at some point, you might need that, because you want to uh, implement a nice user interface saying, Hi, Tim. It's amazing to see you. 
your black hair looks great, stuff like that. I don't know. So identification matters. And details like having a name, date of birth, creation date, I don't know, like anything that could be closely coupled to your account can be valuable. Now, especially things like creation date for accounts are interesting because you could think about is an account that got created one hour ago as valid as an account that got created four years ago? And the interesting thing about this is um, scopes are being used to define the resources that you want to access or the attributes. So scopes can be either static, so you define them once and your application always gets the same data, or scopes can be dynamic. So while you basically do the authentication part, you can define that you want to have the profile, the profile plus the email, things like that. There's different ways to define that because OAuth 2 gives you the freedom to define stuff. And um, lots of companies really do it different. So this is actually not a bad idea, right? Now, identity products had a few issues. OpenID, it was meant to be amazing because it was meant to really identify you. It was developed in 2005, so it's kind of old again. In 2012, there was one big uh, bug being discovered which allowed to hijack authentication, so it was not really secure anymore. And really just a few days ago, Genrain announced that they stopped to use uh, myopenid.com. So your central one identity for the internet might be shut down. So OpenID, while being intentionally right about proving that it's you, had this big flaw. It was really difficult to implement. The spec was huge because it had things in there like auto discoverability and it kind of didn't work. So identity still matters to lots of companies. And one company came up with a solution called Browser ID or Persona, named Mozilla. And that thing was launched in 2011. They brought a new feature out called Identity Bridging, which allows every Google Mail user to log in at this one central service, which might be, again, some central identity service. Browser ID being baked in into your browser in Firefox, and I think there's also libraries for other browsers, and uh, Persona being the one central service in the web. So we've learned that there's authentication, and we've learned there's authorization. But how to combine them both, like really nicely, not just being an off hack? So. The first solution was to come up with OpenID with an extension for um, OAuth, which they call OAuth Hybrid Extension. That thing got drafted down in 2009, but it relied on OAuth 1. So by definition, it was shit to implement, and uh, sadly, uh, there were all these flaws like the OAuth 1 flaw. So while you basically had access to resources and identity, it depended on a bad uh, structure, so it was not really great to use. And then there is OpenID Connect, which is still a draft, but it gets lots of things right. So OpenID Connect is based on OAuth 2, and that's nice for the authorization part, and it adds a big identity layer on top of that in order to make sure that you get a really nice, resource-friendly, REST API-friendly access to resources like your profile. And one of the interesting things is that they um, implemented something they call session management. So on OAuth, usually, if you want to log out as a user, you have to go to a settings page somewhere hidden in a service, and you have to revoke token access. Lots of people don't really know what it does, so they just leave applications be forever. And that's not really the best way to do it. So on OpenID Connect, using this session management, basically, you have an additional endpoint, slash logout, or whatever you want to name it, that you can have in your UI, that you can have as a user to end your own session and basically void your token. So the token that somebody stored in a database or wherever he stored it cannot be used to access new information anymore. So that's quite nice and also, I think, needed. Now, 
I've been mentioning different identity providers. I've been mentioning the social ones like Twitter, like Facebook, like Google. Those are amazing for lots of different use cases like games. You see companies like SoundCloud implementing that. That's awesome. But sometimes in use cases like e-commerce, that's where we come from, you need more concrete data because anybody can put anything on Facebook, right? Um, so you always have to think about concrete data that you can use in your UI to um, improve user experience. And also the nice thing about concrete data is you can rely on it being verified because usually, as an example, if I log in at eBay with my PayPal account and I have the wrong shipping address because I skipped lots of uh, big parts in the registration or something like that, somebody else gets my package or nobody gets it. So it doesn't really help. One thing that I hate and that I really discover nowadays in lots of services are artificial barriers. So that applies not just to the web, but also na to native apps. You go to the website and it says, log in with Facebook, log in with whatever provider you want. And if you don't, you cannot use the service. I call that an artificial barrier because you kind of make sure that this gatekeeper um, keeps out all the users, but some users just want to have a sneak peek of your service, want to understand what you actually really do. And so it makes sense to don't force all these resource sharing things. You want to encourage it. So you say, if you log in again, then you get all your friends showing up and stuff, but at least make sure they can see some of your service before. Now I've been talking a lot about, uh, about the single sign-on techniques, about OAuth and stuff. And you might think, yeah, nice, but why should I actually really use it? So now I come up with numbers. <laughs> um, people forget passwords. There was this consultancy called Blue Ink, and they uh, basically did a survey asking if somebody would type in a security question or would email his old password to his email account or something like that, basically resetting your password kind of things, and only 45% really said, if I have to do that, I'm not going to come back again. People don't like to use passwords anymore. They like to use uh, services that they have anyway. Because if I defined all my properties and attributes, like my birthday, my email address, and all that stuff, I don't want to come up with that stuff again. It's basically um, slowing me down because I want to access your information. And also, especially when you're mobile, there might be so much uh, problems with error-prone pro uh, error data. So if I have to enter my email address, it might be wrong because I was in the tube. Stuff like that. Um, just try to speed up things. There's another fact. People think that social signing is actually desirable. They have these profiles. Please use them. Offer to use them, at least. Now, I've been talking about the whole user experience thing. It's nice that you use it and stuff. But where else can you use authentication? Now, for you JavaScript guys, JSON P might be known. I hope so. <laughs> so um, for cross-domain requests, like uh, getting different scripts from other web services, usually you use either course or JSON P. And now you want to secure this uh, communication and because JSONP is basically an attack vector because you open up your site to um, scripts and callbacks from other sites, you want to secure that. So that's where you can come in with basic auth again. You saw that Mike West spoke about things like the uh, nonce that you can pass for scripts. Those techniques really have to use authentication in order to make sure that your service stays really not at at attacked, nice, and defense. Now, course, who knows course? Awesome. So, especially in the payment scene right now, course is a thing, there's uh, this thing going on they call PCI compliance. So whenever you accept credit card data in your service, you need to be PCI compliant, which means you have to store data in a predefined way, you need to be certified, which costs a lot of money. And companies like Stripe came up with techniques that allow you to basically pass data directly to them. 
And um, we didn't do the same with our API. Lots of other companies nowadays use cross-origin request sharing, which basically makes sure that you have um, something that works against the same origin policy. And again, this is where you could use things like OAuth 2. So our API is an example that now uses um, the authorization bearer token thing to basically pass a header with OAuth 2 to make sure that the payments API call is secure. So this is basically really easy. You do things like um, you do a basic authentication to get the OAuth token, and then you use the OAuth token to do any payments calls. Lots of companies do that, and I think it's actually kind of smart to use the same technique for that. Now, for course, you do things like modifying the XHR by uh, setting the access control headers. So in your request, you say where the origin comes from. So that could be your server, that could be any other server. And you say which other servers are allowed. So you say that, um, that these access control headers are set, and therefore the API bob.com thing from HTML5 rocks enables you to get data back from that. And that's amazing. That really helps. So if you want to have a look at APIs that use that, you can go to github.com. GitHub uses that for their API. And I think it's kind of a good technology and a trend that um, is desirable. Now, Wrapping up things, I think there's a big difference between authentication and authorization, and people shouldn't just use OAuth 2 to um, hack identification into their products. Identity obviously matters, so it makes sense to not just offer one identity provider, but several of them. And also, you might want to think about things like token-based API communication to secure your client-server communication. Don't keep your users out, and now I'm really happy to have QA. Thanks. <laughs>